So as a cat behaviorist, I am often asked, why do you spend so much time helping cats? Why aren't you helping people? But the truth is, when you help cats, you are also always helping people. Now, people tend to assume that if a cat has a behavior problem, the problem must be with the cat. Most of the time, this simply is not true. Most of these cats are not difficult and they really don't have behavior problems. The fact is, their humans have problems and this creates problems for the cats. Whenever a human being has a serious problem, such as illness, bereavement, job loss, divorce, a pandemic, you will often find a cat suffering at the other end of it. So you really never help a cat without also helping a person. Now, don't get me wrong. I help a lot of people whose cats won't use that litter box. Cats who scratch on everything except for that lovely scratching post that you brought home. And what should you do when you bring home Fluffy as a companion for Puffy? And as it turns out, Puffy didn't want a new brother or sister all that much. But I also help people in distress. For example, just recently, a woman contacted me to say she would have to surrender her cat. In fact, she started off the whole conversation by saying to me she was sure there was absolutely nothing that I could do to help. You see, she had cancer and several small children. She was terrified, exhausted, and completely overwhelmed. Amidst all of this, she had an older cat and she was feeling bad because she felt she could not give the cat enough attention. This woman and I talked for a very long time. In fact, I spent a lot of time listening. I listened to her describe her situation. And eventually I said to her, your children are stressed because you are sick, but they will feel even more stressed if they lose the family cat at the same time. I also reminded her that cats are fundamentally loyal, caring, and incredibly perceptive animals, something I'm sure a lot of you guys already know. So if her cat didn't get the same amount of attention for a period of time because she was getting treated for cancer, well, that cat was part of the family and that's what families do and that's okay. I explained to her that the cat would surely prefer to give up some attention temporarily rather than to be separated from her family permanently. Sometimes people just need to be reassured. By then the woman was crying. She said to me, do you really think it would be okay for me to keep my cat? What I learned through all of this was she really didn't want to give up the cat after all. She wanted to do the right thing. She just wasn't sure what that was. In the end, she kept her cat and I promised my help and support. And this is what I try to do every day. Work to solve cat behavior problems so people do not have to sacrifice the cats who they love. Now, I do a lot of cat behavior counsels, between 900 and 1,000 cases every single year. And I do them all completely free of charge. It's my personal mission in life that I never wanted to be, never wanted to be a financial barrier preventing people from keeping their cats in their homes. But when you work with that many people and that many cats, you start to notice some patterns some interesting things that people think. So I'd like to take this opportunity to highlight some, highlight some of those things now. First, cats do not act out of spite or revenge with their pee or poop. Oh, I hear tales of woe. She peed on my bed to teach me a lesson. She peed on the laundry because she was mad at me. She peed on my luggage because she had a feeling I was going to go on vacation. She peed on my shoes because she doesn't like my new boyfriend. Well, actually, maybe that one could be true. Cats are very good judges of character. 
But in all seriousness, I want everybody to know the cats do not pee inappropriately out of spite or revenge. I completely understand that it's easy to assign human qualities to cats because they really do share so many of our emotions. But spite and revenge are qualities we humans can proudly call our very own. Cats are fastidious creatures. Cats want to use their litter boxes. When a cat's not using her block, it's because something or someone in her mind is preventing her from using it. And we need to figure that out. Second, you know that big basket of toys you have sitting in the, in the living room or that big bucket of fuzzy mice that you have sitting and every once in a while you throw a few of those toys on the floor for your cat. That is not what I mean when I say to play with your cat. Throwing a bunch of solo toys on the floor is not play. When I recommend to people that they play with their cat, what I want people to remember is that play is supposed to simulate a hunt. So with solo toys, the cat has to be both the predator and the prey. And that's not very realistic to your cat. Oh, I can't tell you how many times people say to me, oh, my cat doesn't play. My cat's lazy, she doesn't like to play. My cat's old, she doesn't like to play. But the problem is we humans don't take the time to properly trigger the prey drive of our cats. We don't take the time to really simulate a hunt for our cats. And we don't take the time to think about what's important to our cats. So we need to do more thinking like a cat. Now for your cat, the most important part of the game is the capture. So many people think the whole idea is how long you can keep the toy away from the cat. As soon as the cat gets close, they yank that toy away. But the truth is you want your cat to have multiple captures. Your cat will feel empowered and happy with the physical, tangible success that comes from watching, stalking, pouncing, and ultimately capturing. The capturing is the rewarding part for your cat. So the best way to do this is to use a fishing pole type toy, because this way you can really control the game and you can make sure that you're simulating a hunt. So grab that fishing pole type toy and stay with the game for a while intersperse the chasing and the pouncing with plenty of captures. Now, to make this a perfect play experience, again, remember we're simulating a hunt, I want you to finish the game with one last final juicy capture. Think of the prey. The prey is getting injured. The prey is getting tired. The prey dies. And let your cat have that one last final capture and then give your cat a little bit of food to simulate that feast he would have after his hunt. Now this is going to be realistic to your cat and cats who are played with in this way will participate in their play sessions. Now, when you follow the capture with a little bit of food, your cat's brain releases all of those feel good chemicals. And your cat's now gonna feel like king of his castle or queen of her territory. And that's what we want for your cat. So on this topic, now let's talk about laser pointers because this comes up a lot in my cat behavior work. Now, I really wish that pet supply stores did not sell laser pointers as toys for cats. They were developed to be used for PowerPoint presentations in the office and that is where they should stay. Let me tell you, laser pointers are actually the cause of many behavior problems in cats. Think about it. Your poor cat is on this futile chase, pointlessly trying to get this little red dot that can never be captured. Certain of a sure cat, your cat pounces, only to find there is nothing there. There's nothing between his paws. There's nothing between his teeth. It's really not a very good thing to do to your cat because your cat needs to have that capture. Laser pointers can create frustration 
and anxiety in cats. And this is the exact opposite of what we wanna do when we play with our cats. Interestingly enough, laser pointers can also create problems with companion cats. If you're always using a laser pointer to play, your cat's gonna have that need to get a capture somewhere. And if he takes it on the, on the other cat, it may not be very acceptable to the companion cat to be the prey for the cat who's being teased with a laser pointer. It's really important to remember that cats expect a catch and kill after play. So a cat who was teased with a laser pointer may try to attack, bite, or scratch a companion cat or even the humans in the household to get that capture after he's been all revved up. So remember, laser pointers are an unwinnable game for your cat. Your cat's gonna stalk, chase, pounce, and hunt, but will never, ever catch that little red dosh. That anxiety and frustration has to go somewhere, and often it's redirected in ways that are aggressive or destructive. And that's when I get caught. So play smart, play safe, and play in a way that satisfies your cat's natural hunting muscles. And use a fishing pole type toy. The best, the best thing about the fishing pole toy is you a part of the game. So all of these lovely associations and feel good chemicals and feeling great and feeling confident will be associated with you. So it can really create a very powerful cat human bond. You will see a difference, I promise you. So last, last thing that comes up a lot. Cats do not want privacy when they use their litter boxes. Now, I know we want privacy when we go to the bathroom and covered litter boxes from a human, from a human perspective may provide privacy for a cat, but we're placing a human need onto our cats. Cats actually want the exact opposite of privacy. When your cat is in the litter box, she feels very vulnerable. The peeing and pooping position is a very vulnerable position for a cat. And your cat is always aware of all of the potential invaders or opponents or even other cats who can be, who may be on her territory. And it's important to point out that these opponents or invaders can be real or imagined. Even an only cat in the household who has never been outside is concerned about potential ambushes by invaders or opponents. So a covered litter box completely reduces your cat's visual field to be able to see these potential opponents. Worse, the worst thing about a covered box is should an opponent appear, the only way out, there's only one way out, directly into that opponent's face. So that's not very reassuring to your cat. So your cat wants to be able to see all the way around her. Your cat does not want a cover on her box. So if you are having a litter box problem and you do have a covered box, toss that cover. Sometimes people call me in great distress because their cats aren't using the box. I find out there's a covered litter box. I say, toss the cover. The cat then ventures in because she feels safe now in that box. Problem solved. So how did I get here? How did I end up devoting my life to, you know, litter box problems and cat scratching and cats hissing? Um, well, I guess like a lot of things in life, I'm going to go ahead and blame my parents. My parents' view on pets, cats or otherwise, could not have been more different. My dad grew up in Dorchester, Massachusetts, and he grew up in a small, crowded apartment that his immediate family shared with his extended family. Now, this apartment did not allow pets, not that there was room. And they were poor. They wouldn't have had pets anyway. They were barely able to feed themselves. On the other hand, my mother, my mother 
grew up in a single family home where pets were part of the family and cherished family members and, and beloved by all. Later in their marriage, my parents were forced to strike a bit of a compromise about pets in our home when their firstborn, me, seemed to have discovered an endless parade of cats in the neighborhood who really needed me and who somehow ended up at our house. But with all of these cats came responsibility. And I can remember this, it could have been yesterday. I was sitting at the breakfast table eating my breakfast and my dad came walking down the stairs and he saw me eating breakfast and he said to me, Rachel, have you fed your cats yet? And I said, oh no, dad, as soon as I finish eating breakfast, I'm gonna feed the cats. And he made me stop and he said, no, you need to feed those cats before you feed yourself. They're dependent on you, you're their, you're their caregiver, they are vulnerable, and you are the one who takes care of them. So you need to always make sure their needs are met before your needs are met. And that was a very powerful lesson to me as a little girl, um, so much so that to this very day, the first thing I do when I wake up is take care of my cats and feed my cats and clean the litter boxes and do everything to make sure my cats are good and all set before I take care of myself. I deeply loved all of these cats and mourned their loss when one died. And at some point, I began to memorize the names and faces of all of the cats who had lived, loved, and then died at our house. One day, I asked my dad, who was a rabbi, whether all of those cats would meet me in heaven and whether they would recognize me and I them. He assured me that they would, that the cats would remember me and that I would remember them forever. Thinking back, the lesson that I learned was, you know, based on my father's reassurances that relationships with our cats last, that our, that our, our relationships with our cats have meaning, our relations with our cats are enduring. They are important. And to me, it meant that they are worth saving. My name is Rachel Geller. I'm a certified cat behaviorist, and I'm ready to take all of your cat behavior questions now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rachel. So again, folks, um, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Your video does not need to be on, but it certainly can be. Or you can choose the chat feature if you'd like to type them in. We do have a few comments already. Um, one is, I honestly think Dr. Rachel understands cats more than they understand themselves. This <laughs> is outstanding. And somebody else says, our cats have made sure we feed them first. <laughs> <laughs> yes, many people do have that feline alarm clock. <laughs> I, so I'll go ahead and go. This is Sharon Dubois with Bill Ricca Cat Care Coalition, and um, I work for the Air Force. Hi, hi Dr. Rachel. Um, so I work for the Air Force, but I also accidentally started a cat rescue 17 years ago, Bill Ricca Cat Care Coalition, that covers four communities, and I see some of our uh, volunteers online right now. So hi, Maureen and some other folks. Anyway, I wanted to give a shout out to Dr. Rachel because over the last, I would say about a year and a half or so, we've been, I was introduced to her and she has been phenomenal in helping some of the different folks we've had with cat issues. So I just wanted to give her a big shout out and say how grateful we are. And I was actually shocked when I found out that she does this for free because I knew that might be an issue for some people. So I just wanna, again, give a big plug for her and just say from a personal experience as, as a fellow cat rescuer who runs four different communities of cat rescue, she has just been great. So go for it, people, ask her anything. She will be a huge help. Thank Please. you so much. That was lovely, thank you. I have a question and I'll, I'll just uh, use the voice feature here. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rachel, for your time. Um, my name is Dave. I uh, have a cat that I actually got a couple of years ago from Bay Bath. Um, you might've seen him a second ago. He was up having snacks with us and, and he's a great animal. Um, I have a couple of questions. He's basically, you know, he, he's with us all the time and he, he is uh, kind of like, he's the, 
He's the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde of cats. And there's some times where he is the most affectionate cat. Um, he's just purring and loving, he sleeps with you. He's the atypical, just wonderful cat. And then there's times where out of the blue, he will attack you kind of like Cato in the Green Hornet, like just, and he'll come at you, you know, claws, teeth. I mean, he, I don't think he's trying to hurt you being mean, but he does. He comes at you with aggression. And it's, is that normal? Is it, is it, is it normal for cats to run that gamut back and forth, I guess, from emotion? Um, and then my second question is, he's, what is, what is, what is the, what is the general feeling? I think I already know, but what is the general feeling about like keeping cats in versus letting them outside? We're in a relatively rural area. Right? He's, he, he, I know he wants to go out. Um, what do you guys think about that? So that's the Tupac question. Okay, so let me um, attack the um, attacking first. So, um, okay, so just like, just like people, our cats are all very different. And there are some cats who have a very strong prey drive. And if your cat has a strong prey drive, he is going to look for anything that's moving for stimulation and to get that prey drive out. Now, if you are not conducting regular interactive play therapy sessions the way I described, um, use a fishing pole type toy, simulate a hunt, move that toy like prey, okay? Um, sometimes you're high, sometimes you're low, sometimes you're hiding behind furniture, sometimes you slither the ring around, make it realistic, um, let that cat hunt. During the session, the session should be like about 15 minutes long, provide multiple captures, then when the session is about to be over, and maybe say after 12-15 minutes, I don't want you to say, oh, would you look at the time? Session's over. No, I want you to wind that down, let him think he has killed and captured the prey, have one last final super duper juicy capture, and then it must be followed by food. He need, your cat needs to have that hunt. And for a cat to have a strong prey drive, it is essential to wind the game down, provide a final capture and follow up by food. Now, when you follow up by food, you now put your cat into his natural hunt, eat, relax and contentment cycle. So instead of leaving him revved up, we're now leaving him calm down. And that's very, very important. So the first thing I want you to do is get on a schedule of consistent interactive play sessions. And cats are smart. If he knows he's going to have these sessions every day, he is not going to have the need to go after your ankles or whatever he's, you know, whatever he's going after when you walk by. But I can assure you of the only stimulation in his life and the only ability to capture and sink his teeth into something is your skin. That's what he's going to do. But all cats would rather go after the prey and eat yummy food um, after their hunt. So this is going to be a much more appealing alternative. But at the same time, I want to also teach you how to um, distract and redirect your cat because until he learns he's getting these sessions, he's going to still engage in this behavior. So the next time you're walking by and he goes after your ankles, what I want you to do is distract your cat with a toy. It can be a crinkly mylar ball. It can be those things that you shake and you hear like the rice or whatever it is inside the ball. I want you to distract your cat with some type of toy. And I want you to move him away from where he was about to attack you. Now, when you distract your cat with the toy, again, we're shifting him out of this aggressive and anxious mode into the positive mode of a hunter. All cats would rather go after the prey and have a real hunt. So we're gonna distract your cat. And now we're gonna redirect him to a fishing pole type toy. And again, I want you to conduct a little impromptu interactive play therapy session, multiple captures, final capture, food. You remain safe. He gets to release his tension. Everybody wins. So that is what I want you to do in terms of the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde behavior. We really need to give your cat um, the opportunity to hunt in a way that satisfies your cat's need to hunt. Now, the indoor outdoor issue. Oh, I hate when people ask me this question only because I have very, very, very strong opinions on this topic and I am very black and white. I, 
I advise very much against you um, letting your cat outside. So for a few reasons. Um, first of all, it's a myth that cats love being outdoors. Cats are very territorial creatures and cats have a need to monitor their territory. So once you let your cat outside and he is aware that there are many cats out, many other cats out there in his world, some who, some who may be rougher or tougher than he is and his other opponents, he now has this need to monitor his territory, assess the dangers, let other cats know he's there to stand his ground. Um, and he's gonna have this need to keep going out and doing all of this. So he'll be happier just with his own little territory inside. And you can make his life inside just as stimulating as life outdoors. Interactive play therapy sessions um, are one way to do that. Um, vertical space is another very easy way to let your cat feel like he's traveling long distance, distances and going places without ever leaving the house. So um, cat perches, cat trees, chances are you have some shelving that's going unused, backs of sofas, tops of storage containers, there's all kinds of way to create vertical space in your home. Um, and puzzle feeders. So this is one of my favorite ways. I know you can't always be playing with your cat 24 seven, throw some puzzle feeders out on the floor. This way your cat has to accomplish a task, overcome a challenge. And again, it gets that feeling of capture when the food is doled out. So I think I covered all of your questions. If I didn't, you know, feel free to reach out through my website, drrachelcatbehavior.com. I answer every question that comes in through that completely free of charge. So if you need more, let me know. I'm 100% here for you, but hopefully that um, answers your question. Thank you, Dr. Rachel. Uh, we have I at have least, question. I'm sorry, we have at least two questions in the chat about why their cat chews on plastic. Okay. So um, there are two reasons cats usually chew on, two basic reasons cats usually chew on plastic. One is um, anxiety, right? It's something to do and release that tension. And the second is sometimes they are missing something in their diets and most often it's fiber. So um, if you have a cat who's chewing plastic, you can try a couple of things. For the anxiety, again, the interactive play therapy that the, when the cat gets the captures, it releases tension and it boosts confidence. So your cat's gonna feel better about himself. Um, the other thing you can do is try adding a little bit of plain pumpkin puree to the cat's wet food. Um, pumpkin is very high in fiber. Most cats don't mind the taste and there are a few really good cat brands that make a plain pumpkin puree that is formulated for cats. So um, the other thing you can do is um, use deterrence. So if your cat is chewing on plastic all over the house, what you can do is take a bitter anti-chew product that's made for cats, coat the plastic with the bitter anti-chew product, place the plastic about the house on purpose so your cat finds it, and he will come to the conclusion on his own that the plastic is no longer a very appealing thing to chew. But again, when you take something away from a cat, it's always good to provide something else. So make sure you're doing the interactive play throw out some puzzle feeders, things like um, catnip infused tissue paper or cat grass can be great alternatives for your cat as well. Because we have so many questions in the chat, um, what I'd like the others to do if you haven't already put it there is either um, raise your hand with the reaction button or you can also put it in the chat and I'll take them in that order where we have a lot of, lot of great questions here. Um, one person wants to know if you can talk more about uh, what you were saying earlier about how the revenge pee never happens. Yeah, so <laughs> this is a very popular misconception. I, I don't know where it came from, but um, your cat wants to use her litter box. Um, cats are fastidious, clean creatures, and a cat would always prefer to use a litter box over some other area. So Sometimes it's a little bit of detective work to figure out what's going on. I do find that a lot of times it comes down to location. So bathrooms, mudrooms, basements, 
these are all popular locations for, for us, for humans, for cats, but often our cats don't love these locations. So um, litter boxes in the basement, if you have a multi-cat household or you just have a cat who's a little shy and she has to go down a long narrow staircase to get to her box, from your cat's perspective, that might be a harrowing journey. The other thing in the basement is sometimes those laundry noises come on, you know, there's water in the pipes or the spin cycle comes on. And if your cat gets startled when she was in the box, she will associate the box with that fear and she won't want to use the box again. I also see people, you know, tucking litter boxes tightly into corners or against walls. And again, to a cat, this is reducing her visual field. So I find, you know, it's really important to do um, a real estate reality check from your cat's perspective and really look at where your boxes are placed. Um, High-sided boxes can make a cat feel too closed in. Covered litter boxes are a big no-no. Um, Multi-cat household is a whole other thing because you may think your, your cat is just napping in a little area that she likes, but she might be strategically placing herself to block the other cat from going to the box. So there are so many things that go into litter box. You know, to us, it's like a plastic bat, plastic box with some litter in it, but to your cat, it's a huge big deal. And she really wants all of these elements to be met. You know, um, clear visual field, nothing blocking her view, ample opportunity for escape. These are all very, very important to your cat. Um, but I can assure you that cats don't communicate to humans um, with their pee out of revenge or spite. The next question is, we have three cats. Two are 14 year old brother and sister, and the other is a four year old female that we rescued as a kitten. Our four year old doesn't come into the living room with all of us, cats included. She is very tense when in the living room. The cats get along though. What could be going on? Well, um, you know, territory is a huge big thing to cats. And so the lower ranking cat, you know, might be kind of low there on the totem pole and she's getting messages from the other cats. The other cats might be intimidating. The other cats might be posturing. So, you know, if you have a multi-cat household and um, you have one cat who's sort of intimidated by the other cats, I find the best thing is to provide plenty of vertical space for your cats. So the intimidated cat has a place to go and also um, hideaways and tunnels. So sometimes just the cat knowing that there's a safe place to hide or retreat if she doesn't feel particularly confident is really, really important too. Um, the other thing you can try is synthetic pheromones like um, feel away or comfort zone. These are um, synthetic versions of a cat's own feel good deposits that she puts all over the place. So sometimes if you trick a cat into thinking that she's already designated an area or a room or a place as calm and friendly, you can sort of entice her to go into that room. Um, but you might need more kind of hardcore methods as well. We might need to work on more desensitization or rewards or if you can get her to play in that area where she's not coming in, she'll then associate that with something positive. So there's a lot we can do if you, you know, want to reach out to me and discuss it further. The next question is, we foster cats and have had, had issues with two of them meowing overnight. We think it may be separation anxiety, but don't want them to sleep in our bed. Any tips? <laughs> um, yeah, let them in the bed. No, just kidding. <laughs> Because that's what I would do. So, because um, I'm a softie. So, um, if they're meowing overnight, what I would do is let's try to let's try to a reset their internal clock. B give them something to do should they wake up before you, which they're going to do because cat sleep cycles are um, shorter than ours. And B do some other things to sort of create life in the home so they don't feel like the where you are is the only place where the action is. So the best way to reset a cat's internal clock is to do the interactive play session that I just described, but I want you to do it right before bed. And I don't mean like an hour before bed, I mean like right before you go to bed. 
Because when you do it the way I described, ending with the final capture in food, as I said before, you're putting your cat into her natural hunt, eat, relax, sleep cycle. So if you, the later you can do it, the longer your cat's going to sleep. And she's just going to do it because that's, her, that's how her body works. So try to do a play session as late before bed, like the last thing you do before you shut your eyes as possible. Then play session's done, you go to bed. I want you to place some puzzle feeders um, for your cat to have. So if she wakes up before you, she has something to do. So a cat who's busy, a cat who's trying to accomplish a, a task, a cat who's trying to overcome some challenge is a cat who's not gonna meow and bother you. So make sure you have some things for your cats to do. So after you have the play session, go to bed, throw out some interactive play, um, play toys, some puzzle feeders, some stuff for your cat to do. So they're gonna have something to occupy them. Last, um, if you can, in your house, leave a radio on playing softly, um, put your lights on timers. This is a great way, way to sort of create signs of life in your home while you're sleeping. And this will be helpful for that problem too. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what about a rescue cat who used the litter box at first, but has started pooping while being very demanding for attention? And when it isn't provided soon enough, poops around the house? <laughs> Probably the pooping and the attention are completely related, but I, I know this is a very pervasive myth and I don't know where it comes from, but okay. So if, he, if she's not pooping in the box, there could be a few reasons for that. If you only have one box, there are many cats who won't pee and poop in the same box. So the first thing I would suggest is adding another box. Um, the other thing is if, if something happened when she was in that box, so that might be a reason why she used it at first, something happened and now she's not using it now. I always say if there's a change in behavior to consult with your veterinarian. Um, if your cat felt any type of pain during elimination, she won't use that box again because she's go going to associate the box with the pain. So if there was a change in litter box behavior, you know, maybe she's having digestive issues, maybe she has some type of irritable bowel issue, you know, even if she has a urinary tract infection, it's kind of all in the same area. So sometimes cats will stop using the box to pee or poop um, because they have pain. So the pooping position is the most vulnerable position for your cat. And when they don't feel well, your cat knows it and your cat feels vulnerable to begin with. So he may not go into that box again um, if there was pain. And then think about what might've changed. Um, again, like I said, sometimes there's a little bit of detective work. If, if it's, you know, let's assume it's not medical. Did he see an outdoor cat, you know, out the window? Maybe you need to draw your blinds. Did something happen that now the location seems scary? Um, did somebody, did somebody come into your house at some point and the cat was scared in the litter box? So sometimes it's a matter of really going through what's going on in your life, figuring out what might've scared the cat. But like I said in the, my first statement um, regarding this, if you had a problem, like everything was going fine and then suddenly there's a change, I would absolutely rule out something medical with your veterinarian. Thank you. The next question is, um, hi, Dr. Rachel. I know you said for cat soiling outside the box to try uncovered, which I will. I have three boxes. He is soiling all along the walls where two of three litter boxes are and a bit in other rooms. I keep them clean every day. We have another male who he grew up with and does love. I did used to foster other cats in this room. Could it be the smell of the previous cats? I'm at my wits end. He is a very anxious cat. Yeah. So if it's on the wall, then we have marking or spraying rather than inappropriate urination. And the um, approach is very different. So what I would, so yes, there could absolutely, absolutely be vestiges of pee or smells from your previous cats. So I would suggest using um, a black light to make sure you're getting up any deposits or peas that were left from previous cats. 
And after you use it, make sure the, the cleaning product you're using says enzymatic cleaner on it. It's really important that it has that terminology, that nomenclature, because enzymatic cleaner means it's really going to break down the urine. And what I suggest is after cleaning that area with an inch of it, within an inch of its life, then spray it with either comfort zone or feel away spray. So then there's that smell of synthetic friendly feline pheromones there. Um, but let's think about giving your cat other ways to mark his territory, especially if he's anxious. So one thing you can do is rub, take a sock, rub him around, you know, his face and get those glands on the sock and then rub that sock on the wall, um, the four to six inches up off the wall where he's marking now. So this will trick him into thinking that he's already marked. So that's one thing you can do is use his own, you know, cats mark in multiple ways. They're, they have the scent glands around their face and chin. There are scent glands in their paw pads. So they can claim their territory in other ways. So if we get those um, deposits on a sock and rub the sock where he's currently marking, he's gonna think, oh, okay, I've already marked this area. So that's one thing we can do. The other thing you can do is they sell these um, brushes that are self-adhesive onto the wall. So he can go and rub his own shin against the wall. And again, that's another way to encourage him to mark without spraying. Uh, you can also put some food in that area because most cats will not mark where their food is. So that's another thing you can try. Um, you can also try putting a scratching post or a scratching pad in that area because again, um, scratching is also a way for cats to mark. They have the, pot, the deposits in their paw pads. So we can encourage him to mark through scratching via P instead of P. So um, try those few things, you know, put the deposits on the wall, try something adhesive on that same level where he's marking um, feel away or comfort zone. The pheromone products are really helpful with marking because the cat thinks he's already done it and the food in the area. Um, you can even try again, the play therapy, because again, the cat who feels confident gets captures and eats in that area is now going to associate this area with something he's already claimed and conquered. Thank you. Um, you just mentioned feel away and somebody was asking if those collars work. Um, they have two seniors and a kitten under a year. So the seniors are tolerating the kitten, but it's really rocked their world. So <laughs> um, Gino wondered if the products would take the edge off their uneasiness when the kitten gets rowdy. Yeah, I mean, the, the, um, the feel away um, and the comfort zone are, are one piece of the puzzle. I mean, you probably aren't gonna get a collar or spray it and solve the problem, but it can definitely help. I like the spray better than the diffusers or the collar, just because you can directly target certain areas. So typically, um, if there's a problem between the cats, it tends to happen in the same territory. Um, you, if a cat has a favorite napping place, you can spritz a little there. Um, for the cat who's nipping at your ankles, you can spritz a little on the bottom of your pants or your socks. So it's, I find the spray is more helpful because you can directly target the area where you're having a problem. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, my cat won't let go of the toy when she captures it for a minute or two. So I get bored and she doesn't get enough playtime. Is there a way to encourage her to drop the toy? <laughs> I, I would say um, let her, usually when the toy stops moving, so make sure you completely stop moving the toy. Um, once the cat typically sees that the prey isn't moving, she will release her grip or release her jaw. So, you know, give her some time, especially if you're, if you haven't previously ended the sessions with the food, you know, it might be a little bit of a learning curve to get your cat used to the fact that, okay, now that I know I've killed the prey, I'm going to have my feast after the hunt. So if you haven't been doing that, it might be a little bit of a learning curve, but, you know, drop the toy, let her relax. She will eventually let go of it. And then you can um, 
start the game up again. If it's a super duper long time and she's holding on, holding on, you know, if it's going to be like five minutes, then you can try giving her the treat and letting her understand that the, um, that the prey is dead. But you know, if you, if you haven't always been doing it that way with your cat, sometimes it can be a little bit of wiping the slate clean and trying this new method. Thank you. Maureen wants to know, um, she has four cats, a 16 year old, a 10 year old and two one year olds. The kittens play with each other all the time and are great friends. Unfortunately, they like to pick on the older cats and interrupt their naps, etc. Other than physically moving them away, how can I deter the kittens from picking on the older cats? This is a great question because the distraction and redirection method can work for cat to cat, you know, redirection, just as well as I think it was David who asked about the, you know, the cat going after his ankles. So the same idea. So if you see one of the kittens is about to instigate a play session with one of the older cats who's really not so interested in playing with the kitten, distract the kitten with a toy. The kitten wants to play. The kittens have very strong prey drives. The kittens would way rather play with a toy and play in a way that simulates a hunt than going after the older cat. So distract the kitten with a toy, move the kitten away from your older cat, engage in a play session, final capture food. Now, if you do this enough times, the kittens are going to learn that they're going to be getting these play sessions. But even, even if you, you know, don't do it super consistently, all, cat, all cats, especially kittens, would way rather have an appealing play session that resembles a hunt than trying to pointlessly engage you know, an older cat in a session that she doesn't want. Thank you. Um, Michael, I see you just put your, I was gonna call on you, but I see how you have your question here. Um, he's asking how you feel about electric timed auto feeders. Um, I think that they're fine, you know, for some skittish and shy cats don't love them because of the noise. But having said that, you know, they're great for cats who are overweight. They're great for cats who need to be on strict diets. They're great for cats, you know, sometimes if there's multiple people in the house, you want to make sure what the cat's being fed when, you know, these are things that you can monitor. So um, I think they're they're fine or, you know, people who have crazy work schedules and they're away, like maybe doctors or nurses, right? And they're away from the house a few days. And this way, you know, your cat's going to be getting fresh food and getting the right amount of food. You know, some people who have, have um, cats where they really can't let them graze because they'll overeat. So it's, it's another tool that you can use to really control your cat's diet. And especially, like I said, for people who have inconsistent schedules or might be called away it can be very helpful. Awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. Karen, did you want to ask your question? Yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Rachel. We have a mother and two cat, two kittens that well, we adopted them six years ago, so they're not kittens anymore. Um, we got them from a shelter and the mother and the son generally get along well. So they'll sleep together all day and she'll lick him but then he gets very demanding and wants her to lick his head more. So he'll come up to her right in her face and meow at her. And then eventually she gets irritated and a huge fight ensues. And then, you know, five minutes later, they might be sleeping again together. Yeah. Uh, so he's also very demanding of attention with me. Like he'll, you know, like kind of grab me or headbutt me, be like, give me attention now. So my question is, is there anything we could do to prevent the fights? Cause he gets little scratches. He's actually has a like cut on his head right now where she scratched him. And so we're trying to prevent it. Thank yeah. You. So that's, so the perfect thing with your question is, you know, sometimes I'll say to people when their cats, you know, if the cats aren't getting along and fur starts flying or, or, you know, a chase ensues, like try to figure out what precipitates these fights, but you already know what precipitates these. Um, you know, you know that this attention hog cat is going to try to get, you know, get this, do this grooming or get attention. So when you see this cat doing it, again, this is a perfect time to distract and redirect. So a lot of times when cats want all of this grooming and they want it with attention, you know, they have pent up energy or pent up stress or pent up anxiety. They, they want to get it out in some way. So we can always provide 
um, an appealing and enticing alternative for these, these behaviors through interactive play therapy. So distract your cat, again, with a toy, move him away from the cat he was about to instigate with, launch into a little play therapy session, let him get out that those feelings and get, you know, of anxiety capturing the toy. He feels good about himself. He's boosting confidence. He's accomplishing a task. And then he ends relaxed because he's ending with a little bit of food. So um, I think the most common thing I see is people not ending the sessions with, I think a lot of people are super duper good at playing with their cats. They're not always great at consistently ending with that capture and a little bit of food. And when I say a little bit of food, it does not have to be a big deal. You don't have to go um, open up the can of Fancy Feast or something. You know, a, one or two treats, it's all you need. It, it can even be a portion of the cat's regular meal. But try to consistently end with that final capture and that food, because then we're always going to leave our cats happy, content, calm, and relaxed, which is exactly what we want. Usually when they're instigating in some way or going to overgroom or, you know, another cat or bothering another cat, it's because there's a little bit of anxiety, tension, they want something to do, they might be bored. And we can easily provide a very appealing and enticing alternative through play. Thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions at this time? I see a few things in the chat about certain types of litter. I don't know if we're allowed to recommend a certain brand or if you have any um, thoughts on, on types of litters that are better than others, Dr. Rachel. Well, if somebody comes to me and, you know, we've gone through the whole litter box thing, which is a whole, that could be a whole webinar, a whole Zoom presentation in and of itself. But let's say we've looked at location, we've looked at, you know, the, the other cats in the house, we looked at everything. Sometimes, you know, again, just like people, some cats have more or less sensitive paws and some cats, it's really, some cats don't like the additives. Some cats don't like the perfumey litters. So if we determine that it's the litter itself that may be causing the problem, um, one litter that I do always recommend is Dr. Elsie's Catatrack litter. It has a very soft, sandy texture that cats like. So it replicates what they might find outside, but it also has herbs in it that it would attract the cat to the box. So sometimes once we can get that cat to venture into the box and go without a problem, you know, that's half the battle. So um, you know, it's, you know, if you're using a litter, I don't want people to think they have to go out and change the litter. If whatever you're using, your cat is using it, don't rock the boat, um, that's fine. But if you're having a problem and we've looked at everything else, that could be one other piece to the puzzle. And interestingly enough, some cats don't like any litter at all. This is, there are many declawed cats that find litter to be um, bothersome or painful to their paws because their paws are very sensitive. And some cats um, go on the bedding because they actually prefer something like really soft and not, may not be trying to be bad. They just like that texture better. Sometimes I'll say to people, rip up some bedding, rip up some old t-shirts, stick that in the box. Let's see if that works. And often that does. So it's such a very complicated topic. You know, like I said, we just think it's a plastic box with any old litter poured into it. But to your cat, it's like a huge big deal. So it, when I get a litter box pro, um, problem that comes in, it's, it's not usually an easy fix. Thank you. Tom, did you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, I'll ask my question. <clears throat> Susie. <clears throat> um, there are three cats. They were all feral cats in the household. And they're all from the same mother, but one is older, fem older female. And then the other two that we adopted were brother and sister. They're younger. And um, the... The older female cat gets along fine with the male younger cat, but she at times gets a bee in her bonnet to go after the other female cat, the younger one, sometimes with a vengeance. Um, so I was wondering if you could explain that behavior and what could be done about it. Well, cats are very territorial creatures. 
but find a lot of this behavior comes down to territory. So if a cat sees another cat into an, in an area that she perceives as hers, maybe the cat drank out of her water bowl, maybe the cat, maybe the cat you know, ate her food, this could, this could cause a cat to react. But cats are very highly reactive to many things. So maybe there was a noise and the cat can't get to the source of that noise. So she chases after the other cat. You know, maybe something scary happened or something, she senses something. She doesn't know what it is. So she goes after the other cat. So cats are so highly reactive to everything around them that often if they can't get to the source of their agitation, um, they will redirect that to the other cat in the household. Basically, their good kitty judgment goes right out the window and they go after what's ever convenient because that's easiest. So there's lots of reasons for that type of behavior. Um, sometimes a very simple fix, and this is very simple fix. Um, if you want more, I know we're running out of time. Anybody, if you didn't get your question answered, please go to my website, drrachelcatbehavior.com. Ask me your question. I will give you an answer um, as soon as I possibly can. Big Red Sox game tonight. Um, but um, where was I going with that? Oh, an easy, an easy um, fix sometimes oh, oh. is if you have one cat who's consistently aggressive to another cat, um, and if they're strictly indoor cats, you can try a collar with a bell on it. And this way, the intimidate the cats will quickly learn that bell equals that cat, and then that cat always knows where the aggressor is, and that could be very helpful and comforting to that intimidated cat. Hey, thank you. You're welcome, Tom. Are there any other questions? Hi, it's Sharon again. Just one thing. I'm so glad that Dr. Rachel mentioned the um, Dr. Elsie's uh, cat litter because um, I'm sure she would, or, or unless I missed this part, because I did have to step out just for a minute. Um, it's one of the big reasons why animals get, uh, cats get um, brought to shelters is not using the litter box properly. And so somewhere along the line, someone had recommended it to us when we were uh, help, trying to help somebody. And it, I don't know that even you have to use that litter all the time, but we have found, um, and Dr. Rachel, of course you can speak to this, is we found an incredible success rate of people who said, hey, you know what? I started using, and they make up all, they have all these different kinds of cat attract litter for this particular brand. And the success rate is phenomenal with this litter. So just in case, even if it's not your cat or maybe somebody else's, that's why I put the link in there. So it wasn't like it, we're getting a percentage off of recommending them. It was just <laughs> letting people know about it. Yeah, it is a good litter and you know, it is a little more expensive. So as Sharon said, um, you can even just put a, a layer layer of cat attract litter on top of the litter you're using. And you could even maybe do like a 50, 50 mix. There's many ways you could do it if you, you know, want to make sure that I always try to be respectful to of people's financial limitations, especially when it comes to um, cat behavior, because I do find that um, if the cat has already peed on three couches and you've got to toss three couches, you may not really be thrilled about spending extra money on your cat. So there's many, there are many roads to Mecca. Usually we can figure something out. <laughs> 